Okay, so we're going to look at some exam style questions on electricity and magnetism, starting off with some magnetism. So the diagram shows the view from above of a sheet of cardboard on top of a bar magnet. The dotted outline shows the outline of the bar magnet, which is underneath the card. Okay, so describe how the pattern of a magnetic field around the bar magnet can be shown experimentally. You may wish to draw on the diagram as well as right on the lines below. So I think there are two ways you could go about doing this. One way is using iron filings. So you sprinkle iron filings across the card and then lightly shake it until the iron filings align themselves in the magnetic field. So it's not just enough to pull the filings on. You, they, they will generally land on field lines, but not quite. When you shake it, they'll all line themselves up and sit on top of field lines. You can also use a plotting compass to actually mark out the path of one field line by essentially just marking where the north point of your compass goes points and then moving your compass around to complete a field line. Say how you would identify the north pole of a magnet. Well, there's a few ways I think you could do it. So you could find out which end attracts a south pole or what, which end repels a known north pole. Or you can look for the end to the north pole of a compass point away from. Because remember, compasses point from north to south. So that would work too. So two magnets are laid on a bench. End A of an unidentified rod is held above. Each end in turn with the results shown. So you can see it's attracted to both ends of the magnet. So just what the unidentified rod is made from? Well, it's got to be iron or some other soft magnetic material. The key is it can't be a magnet because it's attracted both ends. It must be something that can become a magnet in the presence of a magnetic field or soft magnetic material. So state, if anything, what happens when the end A is held over one end? of an unmagnetized iron bar, uh, well, nothing is going to happen. It's a soft magnetic material. It's not a magnet. So uh, when it comes into contact with iron, nothing's going to happen because an uh, iron bar doesn't have its own magnetic field. Uh, uncharged plastic rod, again, nothing is going to happen. It's not magnetic, so nothing's going to happen. So the diagram shows four identical plotting compasses placed around a bar magnet where the magnetic field of the surroundings can be ignored. The pointer has only been drawn on one plotting compass. Draw the pointers on the other three and to indicate the direction of the field. Uh, so this one is going here. So the compass will point towards the south pole because it always goes from north to south. And here it will just follow the field lines. So field lines go from the north pole round to the south pole. So the compass will align itself with those field lines. Okay, so the diagram shows a reed relay in a simple circuit. So you can see we've got a power source, a lamp. We've got a switch that's currently open, but we've got a relay wrapped around it, presumably to allow us to close the switch. So explain why the iron reeds touch each other when the switch is closed. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to get a current in the wire, which is going to get to have a magnetic field around it. And that's going to magnetize the iron and it's going to magnetize them both in the same direction because they're wrapped around both switches in the same way. And that's going to mean that they attract each other, which closes the circuit. OK, so that's now been incorporated into a temperature operated alarm where the light bulb is now a warning lamp. And we've got a thermistor to essentially detect temperature changes. So when the thermos is cold, its resistance is too high to allow sufficient current to operate the reed relay. So small current means weak magnetic field, so we're not going to have a big enough magnetic force to close the switch. The resistance of the thermos decreases as the temperature increases. Describe what happens to make the warning lamp light as the air temperature changes. Well, essentially what's going to happen is when the current reaches a certain value, the iron reeds will attract, completing the circuit, activating the warning light. And the reason the current increases is because the resistance of the thermos are decreased as the temperature rose. So if resistance decreases, the current is going to increase. So a length of flexible stack wire is fixed to A and B so that part of it is held vertically in the field of a horseshoe magnet as shown. Okay. So 
The diagrams each show the same section throughout the apparatus. The wire between A and B is not shown. And the reason is because we're going to draw that in. So on the diagram, draw what the wire might look like when a large current passes through it. So A and B are both fixed. So the wire isn't going to be able to like physically move but what's going to happen is it would bend um, and it could bend to the left as well we're not told which direction the field is in or the current is or anything but it's going to bend or distort in this kind of way to so explain why the wire looks like this well the current carrying wire experiences a force from the magnetic field which causes it to bend because remember current carrying wire has a magnetic field the permanent magnets have a magnetic field, they'll interact and they'll give you a this magnetic force. So draw what the wire might look like if the current is reversed. Essentially what it's going to do is it's going to bend the opposite direction or deflect in the opposite direction. So the diagram shows a long straight wire between the poles of a permanent magnet. It is connected through a switch to a battery so that when the switch is closed there is a steady current in the wire. Okay. State the direction of the magnetic field between the poles of the magnet. Well, they go from north to south. So the wire is free to move. The current is switched on so that its direction is into the page. State the direction of movement of the wire. So it's going to be down. And we're using Fleming's left-hand rule for this. So uh, the field goes from north to south. So that tells you your first finger direction. The current is going into the page. That tells you your middle finger direction, so you should see that your thumb is now pointing down, which is how we got the answer. The experiment is the basis of an electric motor. Describe two changes shown that would enable continuous rotation to take place. Well, we're going to need to coil the wire up into a loop, uh, or a coil, if you like. And we're also going to need to connect a split ring commutator, because that's what allows it to keep rotating in the same direction. So the apparatus shown in this diagram can be used to indicate when there is a force on the copper rod. Okay, so you've got a hanging copper rod, and we've got a magnet, so that if we get a current through the copper rod, that is going to move. Okay, so just what is seen to happen to the hanging copper rod when a switch is closed? Well, it's going to move. Uh, fairly simple. So why is it going to move? Well, the magnetic field from the current carrying wire interacts with the permanent magnet's field to produce a magnetic force. That's what causes the movement. So the cell is reversed and the switch is closed. How does what is seen differ? Well, it's going to move in the opposite direction. Fairly simple. So the diagram represents a DC motor. Uh, so we need to label the parts. So the top box is labeling the split ring commutator. You can see the splits in the top and the bottom. Connected to the commutator are the, is a brush or the brushes. There are two of them. And then the final part is the permanent magnet there. So which part of the motor ensures the coil keeps rotating when the battery is connected? It's the split ring commutator. The battery is reversed. What difference does this make to a motor? Well, it spins in the opposite direction. So a student holds a polythene rod in one hand and a dry cotton cloth in the other. How can the student cause the rod to become charged with static electricity? Well, you rub them together. Fairly simple. How can the student detect when the rod has become charged? Um, so there is a piece of kit called a gold leaf electroscope that would work, but a much simpler way would just put it near one of your hairs and see if they move because of it, or some pieces of paper and see if they move. There's a few tests you can do. Around the charged rod will be an electric field. What is meant by an electric field? Well, it's the region in space where a charged particle experiences a electric force. So you need the charged particle part and we've got an electric force. So the charged polythene rod is brought close to another charged polythene rod so that is suspended from a nylon thread as shown. And you can see that they're both negatively charged, or at least the ends that they're bringing together are. What would we see happen? Uh, well, it would be repelled or it would, because it's suspended, it's probably going to spin away, actually. So why does this happen? Well, like charges repel. So they're both negatively charged, so they're going to repel each other. So if the student uses a copper rod instead of a polythene rod, why would he not be able to charge the rod? Well, copper is a conductor, so you can't build up charge on it because it's just going to conduct that charge away. 
So the diagram shows a 240 volt AC main circuit, which a number of appliances are connected and switched on. Okay, so they're all in parallel with each other, so they've all got a potential difference of 240. Calculate the power supply to the circuit. Well, we just need to add the four powers together, giving us 1520 watts. So the appliances are connected in parallel. So explain what that means. Well, it means the current has to split between the components, but the potential difference across them is going to be the same. That's what it kind of means. So take two advantages of connecting the appliances in parallel rather than in series. So they both get 240 volts potential difference. That's nice. And if one breaks, the other still works, which again is a typical advantage we should say here. Calculate the current in the refrigerator. So I'm going to use P equals IV. We know the power, we know the potential difference, so that gives us the current. So the energy used by the fan in three hours, so we need to multiply the power of the fan by the time in seconds to give us the energy. And then to get the resistance of the filament of one lamp, First, I'm going to calculate what the current is using the power and the potential difference. Then I'm just going to use the resistance equation to calculate the resistance is 960. And that completes this set of questions.